Hi, everyone, and welcome to All Things Creative. I'm your host, Linda Riesenberg Fissler, and today we have Jamie Markle with us, and I'll uh, bring Jamie in here in a few minutes. But I just wanted to talk about uh, what we've been up to, or what I've been up to, basically, for the last year. Um, I haven't really done very many art, what we used to call art chats, what I'm now come, calling All Things Creative, because I wanted to expand um, my pool of guests and um, at times just kind of record something off the top of my head that I think might be helpful for folks. So short little what I call blog casts or have the opportunity to have people on the show like Jamie. And I'll talk a little bit at the end of the show about who I'm trying to line up for early 2018. And um, I've got yeses from the, the two folks, two to three folks that I'm um, talking to, and we just have to come up with a date. And that's one of the big reasons why I stopped like assigning these to the third Thursday of the month at 1.30 is because we have all gotten so busy with our schedules and with life, which I think is wonderful, um, that it was really kind of hard to nail folks down to a specific date. But I do want to thank Jamie for um, kind of doing this on the fly with me to kind of round out 2017. So welcome, Jamie, to All Things Creative. And um, how you been? Thanks, Linda. I'm happy to be here. I'm doing great. I'm like you. I'm trying to enjoy the holidays as much as possible, <laughs> and also just take one day at a time, as they say. Sort of, you know, live life to the fullest. Right. Yeah. So a year ago, you were um, in a different job. Let's just say that <laughs> publisher for F and W Media, and you've launched your own art career now. And so um, I'm going to put one of your your paintings up here quickly. So uh, basically, tell us what you've been up to. I know you've been doing a lot of this, um, the animals, you've done some portraits and things like that. But tell us, you know, um, what you've been up to in the last year. All right. So I left F&W at the end of January 2017. And the first thing I did was I took a deep breath and I took some time off. Um, <laughs> Good for so you. I, I basically took a couple months where I just said, I just want to think about what I want to do next, where um, I see myself in a year, five years, and just sort of, um, you know, take inventory of my personal life and my professional life and then go from there. So I um, did a lot of reading. I took a wonderful art retreat out in Taos, New Mexico for a week with Seth after and Roxanne Evan Stout. We had a really wonderful uh, weekend of making and connecting with other artists. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've, um, I've got a couple things going on now. So I've launched my own art career and I've also launched my own um, mini editorial services business. So I'm helping um, some other publishers um, doing some writing, doing some publishing advice, uh, helping people sort of figure out what they want to publish. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing more of that. But really, what I'm really excited about is that I've had time to get back into my studio and get back in touch with painting, which for the last probably five years, I wasn't able to do um, as when I was working at F&W, because as publisher, that's a really big job. Mm -hmm. And I um, decided to dedicate my time and energy to other artists and now i'm going to be able to dedicate my time and energy to myself so i'm really excited about that yeah it sounds great i know you kept busy we've met for lunch a couple times because we live pretty close to one another um just down the highway from each other basically in, right. south, in southwest ohio so I, I knew you've been keeping busy and and um and had a lot of you know neat opportunities and some revelations around you know your art and and working with art and working with different materials and things like that and and how happy you've been to be able to get back in into that um i was i don't I keep thinking line of work but that's not exactly sure. <laughs> it is work we both know that but it is work. It's fun work um, you know it's not like corporate it america <laughs> so. right and you know art you know art is so it, it's so many different things right it's work right. it's play it's it can be a career it can be a hobby it can also be um a practice and it can also be um something that's that's very rewarding while being challenging right. and i think that for me over the summer and sort of the last six months it's really this part of where i am right now i would say is sort of reconnecting with the creative process right and for me that that was 
getting in touch with my skills again and realizing which ones I still had and which ones I needed a little brushing up on, trying to figure out what excited me about being in the studio, and then just sort of dedicating the time to see where it went. And I, if I'm honest with myself, I think that what I've been doing has been exciting and interesting to me and has been a great kickoff to getting my creative practice going. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I've noticed in the last couple of weeks is that it's starting to lead to other ideas, which I think that if you're in a healthy place and you're, you're not stressed out, that's part of one of the things that we all enjoy about being creative, right? It's, right. it's what's going to come out of it next. And, you know, currently I've been playing with creating surfaces with recycled paper, mostly magazines, mm -hmm. um, magazine pages. And the nice thing about that is, you know, they're, they're two sided. So you, you have often images on one side and text on the other. And as somebody who has a great love and affinity for text, incorporating that into my work has been something I've enjoyed for quite a while. So I've been experimenting with those collage backgrounds and then putting watercolor, um, either painting animals in watercolor and incorporating them on top mm -hmm. through collage, and then putting a faux encaustic sealant on the top so they get sort of a matte finish. Yeah. or painting directly on those surfaces using acrylics. So one of the things I'm trying to get to is where there's the painting is direct enough and not too layered that those that layer from below shows through. And I'm not quite there, but I will get there, I am okay. sure. Okay, I don't, I'm, I don't know if you're on your computer, but this little area here, can you see it, your little bunny? I can't see it. The it's not coming up on my screen. I just have the lead-in page. Uh oh, oh, am I not sharing? You're talking about the. I don't know. You know, you're talking I'm not about the sharing. Paint? Hold on. See if you can see it now. That little bunny. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we're sharing yeah, so, now. So, yeah. So that centerpiece, like that's a piece of collage underneath. Mm -hmm. And you right and there. you want to cover that completely, or do you want to have that coming? Yeah. I want to have more of that coming through. Oh, okay, good. Because I was say I really like this. <laughs> yeah, like that's, that's one of the things that and the abstract nature of the backgrounds are the two things that are exciting me the most these days is sort of what can I do to reveal that the layer below. Mm -hmm. And part of it is how how good can I paint <laughs> at the gate without having to fix you know, or to make corrections along the way. So the more the, the more painting and the more drawing I do, I think the, the sooner I'll get there. Um, that's just a matter of practice, right? Like how is what how are how are my skills when it comes to using paint as a drawing medium yeah. in some ways. So. Well, well, that kind of takes us into the other question that we talked about um, before we went on the air, and and that was, you know. When when you look back at all the advice you gave us, because we did an ammo art chat back when I started doing this, gosh, three or four years ago, and we did like a 30 minute show and I had you on and you were giving advice to artists about how to become published in, you know, like the artist magazine or any a publication and things that we needed to do and, you know, what you needed to have and how to present yourself professionally. And, and we kind of chuckled about this because you knew I was going to say, did you ever say to yourself now that you're on the other side of the looking glass going, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> my, my first thought was, boy, that's easy to say. And it's really hard to do. Yeah. Because advice is very easy to give. And it's often very hard to follow. And if I think about my own advice, I think, sure, I do some of those things. I probably don't do all of them. But I, I do think that it was still good advice. I also think it's a tall order to be doing everything that you should be doing. And that goes for anybody, myself right. included, right? right? Yeah, so I think, absolutely. and I think for me, for me, it's pick the ones that are gonna make the most difference right away. And then you build on that set of skills or that that thing and become good at that. And when you're to 80% of being really good at that, you move on and you add something else. So if you're not, if you needed to do one thing, I would say, build yourself a website, get good at that, and then get over on Instagram and start getting good at that or get on Facebook and, you know, and then add the other things, you know, and figure out what's going to challenge yourself enough to get your career moving. Right. Yeah. Good. I think that's great advice. It, you know, I, I'm sitting while you were talking, I was sitting here thinking, we all think that all of this is just going to become instant. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm going to go build my website. I'm going to go out and start, 
texting about what I'm doing and I'm going to, you know, put stuff up on Facebook and all of a sudden I'm going to be discovered and, you know, I'll be famous and I'll be selling, you know, so many works that I won't be able to keep up or, or whatever the dream is that you have. It, and, you know, it, it's kind of, you kind of have, the, at least I do have this constant battle going on with why isn't this happening quicker? <laughs> what else do I need to do? And, you know, I, I always find myself, I don't know about you, Jamie, but I always find myself trying to ground myself into just do what it is that you love to do. And, you know, you, you'll find people, people will find you. And, you know, you may not be Paul Newman or, you know, Sissy Spacek or <laughs> whoever, but, um, you know, at least you're doing something you really enjoy doing. And, and that's the key. Uh, I would agree. I think you should always do focus on what you love and then don't be afraid to challenge yourself either. Right. You know, because if you do the same thing all the time, you're going to be doing the same thing all the time. Mm -hmm. And that that's that that's not growth. That's stagnation. So mm -hmm. I think as artists, it's really healthy to get it outside of your comfort zone. And and, you know, the good thing about it is you can find the balance. So if you love painting landscapes, I would say what you do is you paint a lot of landscapes and get really good at painting landscapes. And that's the thing you're passionate about. The way to stretch yourself is then try to pitch those to somebody to get a show or put your work out there in a different way to try to get attention. So you can have your comfort zone, which is the painting part for, for pe some people. And then you can grow by trying to become a honing your business skills or reaching out to people, which which is challenging to a lot of people. I mean, it's hard for a lot of, not just artists, but anybody trying to do something new and trying to, especially if they don't know how to do it, right? right. Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's interesting too, because when you were saying that, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, do what you love doing and then try to seek representation. For artists, that's gallery and exhibition, you know, whatever. It, for For writing, that's seeking an agent, trying to get a traditional publisher to, to represent you, you know, and, and those are huge steps and, and it is challenging. Absolutely. And we are in such a chaotic time when it comes to how to get your work out there and mm -hmm. what's the best thing for individuals, because there's a gallery market and a lot of people want to be in galleries, but, you know, galleries only have so much space and so much marketing bandwidth and they're going to stick with what works for them because they're running a business too. Mm -hmm. So the other option is trying to go direct and sell directly, but you know, then you need to build up your whole marketing. You know, you need to build up your own collector pool, which is not an easy, that's not easy, right? It's not so, right. <laughs> and it's the same thing with publishing is publishing isn't what it used to be, you know, and a lot of people are trying to self publish, as you know, that's one outlet. <laughs> hmm, me? You, I know you, you've done it, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, it, we're, at this, we're at this really interesting time where there used to be a really clear path to success. Right. And I think that, that path is not so clear anymore. And I think the solutions to that problem or that challenge is going to be different for everybody. Yeah. And when and you, and when you excuse me, when you have this multiple path thing going on, there is the cream that will always rise to the top, naturally. But Absolutely. There's, but there's also, you know, people that are going into that first avenue of representing themselves or, uh, you know, or, or trying to publish something there on their own. Um, and you get lumped into, oh, you know, I would never read that person because they're self-published or I would never buy that person's art because they aren't in a gallery. So you have all of those old stigmatisms, if you want to call them that, or stigmas, you know, that are associated with how it was done in the past that they may not jump over and do what's going on in the in, in the now. So, yeah, so it's like really muddled and hard to work through that. Absolutely. And I, and I, and I, and it's still changing, right? Yeah. We don't have, we don't have a set, um, a set format. And it's really interesting. I had a piece in a show, a local show um, last month. I just picked it up this past week and it didn't sell on the show, but someone saw a post on my Facebook page and they were like, can I buy that painting? I was like, you can, if it doesn't sell on the show, I'd love to sell you that painting. Right. So it's really interesting how those, that sort of like my goal of being in a show to get exposure and to sell my work worked, but in a really weird way, right? Like it worked because I talked about it on social media and then somebody bought that painting. 
Yeah, so I, I, it, yeah, you have to do it all in some ways. Right, and I remember like years ago, back, um, I, you know, maybe like in the early 2000s, like 2001, 2002, 2003, we had people in the galleries, or at least I had heard of people in the gallery saying, well, if you're selling online, I don't want you in my gallery. And it was like, That's wow. <laughs> yeah, and so, some galleries still have that. They still have that policy. And uh, again, it's a dialogue between artists and galleries, and each um, each of those two entities will have to figure that out. Right. I think most galleries are aware that artists sell direct. I, I think that what I think a bare minimum is an artist shouldn't sell something that's hanging in a gallery direct. Exactly. You know, and, and I know some artists and galleries they come to the agreement where where they still give the gallery a commission, per, perhaps mm -hmm. a reduced commission. Right. You know, so people work it out differently. Other artists, they just sell direct and they don't, they don't include the gallery at all and the gallery's okay with that. You know, it's just, there's a lot of different models out there and I think um, it just depends on the relationship. Yeah, yeah, it, it, but I, I, mean, I am finding it but I, I interesting that, that that whole business model is changing and, and like you said, there there's that whole range there from, you know, only in my gallery or uh, or in my gallery for a hundred mile radius, and or there's you know all those different scenarios that come under that. It is and it's just now gotten broader with um, artists representing themselves uh, on the net. And uh, you know, I, I have to be honest, a lot of my commissions come from Facebook and um, sure. you know and family, so <laughs> and friends. So you know, it's um you do what you have to do so that you can make some money and keep, you know, buying those supplies so you can keep creating. So. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I've been going to um, a Monday networking group of other creative professionals and some of them are painters. Some of them are writers. Some of them are graphic designers or um, even there's a, a cook or a chef or two. And, you know, they talk about where work is coming from and more and more it's coming through Facebook. It's coming through Instagram. Um, it's really an interesting model and it's a little challenging too, because it's hard to replicate, I think, mm -hmm. you know, like, cause you can't control who sees your posts. Right. <laughs> um, and you know, is it going to lead to work or not? And I, and you know, it has for me, you know, I've actually had a couple commissions off of Facebook and you know, I sold that painting. So it's, it's, you know, for the first six months of a business, I'm, I'm very pleased with that. But I wouldn't say that if I put on my business hat and say, how am I going to build a revenue model around this? I can't say that I would be able to do that right. effectively, you know, just sort of on, I don't have enough data to say what, what works and what doesn't yet. Yeah. I think the most frustrating part um, around social media and um, like going through, I'm thinking now more of my, my books um, going through Amazon or one of the online self-publishing great places, create space, whichever, um, is that there are a lot of people that are connecting with you, downloading a book, you know, maybe looking at your images, things like that, but you never see them. You never really hear from them unless they a leave a review or b contact you because you have your email address in in whatever you know area that they can find it that that is public that that email address is public. Um, you never hear from from people. So like there and for my books, for example, there's a whole group of people out there that are reading my books and I'm so appreciative, <laughs> so happy about that, but I don't know who they are. <laughs> so it's kind of this double edged sword where I, if I look at my art side, you know, I know who my collectors are and I know who the people are that really like my art and uh, who really like the talk shows and, and the different things like that that we're doing. Uh, and they're, you know, but there still is a percentage, but it's a smaller percentage of those people that I don't know versus in the publishing world. So it's really kind of strange. Yeah, but do you, I think that it's, that's, it is a little strange, but I, I do see how for your painting work, you know, that's a one-to-one -one relationship where yeah. you're buying, you're creating one thing that only one person's really ever going to enjoy. Right. Hopefully your books will reach many people and many people will enjoy them because because when you write, I'm assuming you don't write for one person in mind, right? You're writing, oh, well, you're write writing something, that you're writing a story <laughs> right, for you, right? You're writing a story because you want to get it out into the world. Right. And hopefully a lot of people will engage with it. 
Yeah, so it, it it's just you know how do you turn you know like, there's a lot of models out there and and some of some of which that can be reapplied for artists where you know you, you give something away for free off of your website so that you can grab an email address and hopefully they hang around and read your newsletters that you send out. So you know that kind of philosophy, whether you're doing books or whether you're doing um, artwork, you want to build an email address so that you can you know basically a library of email addresses so that you can send out your newsletters and, and have people interested in what you're doing and, and things like that. So you know, there are some philosophies that, that work on both sides. And unless you get that email address on, ad, address on the author side, that was hard to say, um, you know, you really don't know those people. And that's probably the most frustrating thing is, you know, a lot, a lot of people that are reading books don't want you to know <laughs> that they're reading your book. So, and I'm not sure why that is. I mean, it's not a bad thing. I don't mean it in a bad thing. It's just like they just want to remain anonymous. And that's, you know, it's, it's after having that one-on-one -on -one experience as an author with, as, as an author, that's kind of, that's hard to deal with every once in a while. It's like, why won't these people tell me who they are? So. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. people who read are mostly introverts and asking them that question is going to be, um, <laughs> That's a tall order for some people. Like, yeah. I just want to read my book and go home. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so learning to accept that is, is you know, my big thing for maybe 2018. So. Well, well, as a publisher, that was a challenge we often talked about, is that how do we know more about the people who are buying our yeah. products so that we can deliver more products that they like? And, you know, you could get some information, but it really is not Sorry. that definitive. There, was a, there were a lot of leaps about who we thought those people were. Yeah, I remember when I was doing consumer comments at Procter & Gamble, we always did this ratio, ratio of for every consumer complaint we had on a pamper diaper, there were 33 people who did not bother to call us and just left the brand. So, Absolutely. So it's kind of, now I don't know, that was that's old data, by the way, um, because I haven't worked in consumer comments for like 20 years now. So that, that number may be higher now or it may be lower, who knows. But um, that was kind of like, one of the things that we looked at at the time and um, you know when you're getting a couple thousand comments for a problem on a on a product and then you multiply that times 33 it, it got upper management right. attention <laughs> so, absolutely yeah so one of the things that I gave you a heads up on we're going to go into that uh, conversation now is I was told you I was going to ask a question of what traits or skills um, do you think an artist needs to possess to be and I'm putting little quote marks around successful because I think we each define what success is for ourselves. But um, so I know you were thinking about it. So what, what I do, I, I have a list. Oh, wow. You <laughs> so, even wrote a list. I did. I wrote a list. I mean, I gave um, you this question, what, an hour, two hours ago? <laughs> right. I, I started thinking about it about an hour and a half ago. Um, so I, I would say, you know, there are five or six things that I think really would serve artists well to think about as they think about if they want to develop a, an art career or even just be a happy painter, you know, and get your work out there. So the first thing I had on my list was it really was talent and skill mm -hmm. and knowing the difference between the two. Um, you know, talent, I feel, is something that you're that you either are born with or have developed early on. And skill is how you take that talent and hone it and, and make the most of it. So I think some people are very talented. Some people are very skilled. And I think you need a combination of both, but I think it's the skill part that really sets people apart from, you know, like th that is what serves the professional artist or somebody who wants to be more than just a hobby painter well, is developing those skills and, and knowing what your skills are. And then I would just say, and then applying it, just paint, 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 paint. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be number one. I, I think if you're going to be a professional, you need to think about your art as a business. Um, so, you know, there's just some basic business skills or life skills that I think everybody needs to, have and some of those things are just simple like being organized you know like you, you just can't treat it like it's a hobby you know be organized um set some goals for yourself whether that's i'm gonna paint 20 hours a week 
And I would say, let's say that's your goal and then set those office hours where you're going to paint 20 hours a week and, and block it out so that you, you put the time in. Um, I also think following up with people and treating people respectfully when they reach out to you, I think it's really frustrating when somebody reaches out and you don't get a, you don't get a follow up email or call, um, you know, within 24 hours or 48 hours. Right. Um, I think you need to have some sort of billing and invoicing and tracking system. So that's, you know, that, that, like, if you're going to be in business, you have to have those skills. And then I would also say, like, to wrap up the business part, if you can't do something, find somebody who can do it for you. Yeah. Because I don't think that everybody has all the skills, but running a business, you know, like, you would find somebody who can help you with those things. So if you're not good at, at billing and taxes and things like that, find a local accountant who can help you. Um, if you're not good with graphic design, find somebody who is, who can, who can build some respectable cards or business cards or whatnot for you. So I think those are, you know, knowing when to outsource is very helpful and it alleviates some stress. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to pay everybody for everything. Some people work for swaps. Um, and those are sort of like the business part, that's sort of like when you're further down the road, when you find yourself selling, you know, like that's when you might want to start paying for some of those outside services. I think people, they can be easily distracted by the, I'm running a business and set up things that are business things like having an accountant or a brand or a business card when really what they need to focus on is selling more work and, and sort of making more work. Mm. Um, the third thing I thought of, and these aren't really in any order, um, good communication skills. And when I th think about communication, I don't just mean being able to talk, I mean sort of having an understanding of what it is you're making. So you need to be able to say, I'm a oil painter, I'm an oil painter who paints and plein air, let's say. And then you need to hone that to say, I'm an oil painter who pa paints and plein air. I prefer to do seascapes with a limited color palette on the West Coast. So the more you can describe what you're doing and the better at it you get, the more you're going to be able to talk about it because that sort of leads to my second sub point is you need to speak confidently about your art and, and, and talk authoritatively about what it is. And that doesn't mean you have to be an authoritative on all things art. You just need to be an authority on your own art. So you need to be able to say, this is my process. These are my subject matters. This is why I paint. Here's where you can find more about it. And then under other, also under communication, I think just knowing how to build relationships, and that kind of goes back to treating things like a business where when you make a connection, let's say it's with a potential collector or a gallery or um, someone else who might exhibit your work, follow up, you know, make sure that you send that follow up email, you know, um, if you promise to do something, you know, do it and make, make an effort to make sure that you stay in the forefront of people's minds. And that's really, you know, that's how you build success. The other thing is, is marketing <laughs> would be the fourth point. And this is, this is a topic that can go on and on and on. So it's really interesting under skill and talent. I had one bullet point, which was paint, paint, paint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and under marketing, you know, I've got, I've got like six or seven. Um, Cause um, marketing, ugh, you know, it's such a, it's so important and it's the thing that people like to do or think about the least in some ways. And I understand why, because painting is fun and marketing, there's a lot of things you can do to market your work and it's hard to, it's hard to validate some of them, right? Like you're, right. you're like, when you paint something, you have a result in front of you and you can say, gosh, that's a darn good painting or gosh, that's a piece of crap and I'm going to start again. But with marketing, mm -hmm. you could say, well, I put out this newsletter, 50% of the people opened, maybe I'll get a sale, or mm -hmm. I've been putting out a newsletter for two years, is anybody buying my painting? But maybe they walked into a gallery, maybe they bought a painting off of Facebook. It's hard to say how those efforts pay off in the end, but they're really important. Mm -hmm. um, and so under marketing, I've got, you know, one is I think you need to understand your overall market. and. So for a, a painter, that would mean understanding your local market, 
who are the galleries in your region who are the galleries in your region who sell work like your work and does your work does other work similar to yours sell that's one of the questions i would ask is there room in the market for more work like that meaning can you enter that market and then what about your work is unique that would compete with the other people who are already painting and so i think that sort of goes back to that communication point is what is it about your work that you can convey that makes it special right. so i would say you know understanding the market is really important um then also like how do you market you know like how are you going to market your work are you going to have a newsletter you need to have a website that's definitely something that everybody should have and they're not they're not that hard to put together and they're not that expensive these days you also need to have a social media presence um, and again you need to find those people on who are on social media who want what you have to offer mm -hmm. so i would start following those local galleries i would follow the national galleries i'd follow regional and national publications that relate to your work I would follow your favorite artists. I would, you know, I would start there. The list can go on and on, but find find those relevant connections and start seeing what those people and entities are doing so that you understand what's happening in your market and how you might fit into it and how you might be able to um, sort of play within that, that space. Um, the other thing is I would say, you know, you need to start networking within the industry and social media is a good place to start, but then that's also, it's going to galleries, it's it's building a collector base, it's um, trying to connect even with some suppliers and manufacturers, and that could be through your local art store, it could be through a national event. Um, you also, I think you should connect with other artists in your area. If you've got a local art club, um, a local art center, you know, that's a really good way to start connecting with people because my guess is that there are plenty of other artists who are at your skill level, no matter what it is, that it would be worth knowing mm -hmm. um, either locally or regionally or, or nationally and, and make those connections because they might know somebody that could help you grow your career, right? So mm -hmm. those would be the things that are marketing. Um, that I would, I would say, you know, knowing where you fit into the market though is, is probably key and understanding that overall market and then starting that website, starting a newsletter, doing some blogging. Um, so trying to hone your, you know, your writing skills. And, you know, you don't have to have a lot of writing to have a blog. It could be visual to some extent, show your process, show things that inspire you. There's a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Then finally, the fifth thing that I think really makes people successful or, or really can help you is, is you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe in your work. Right. And because I think we all know that part of being an artist is taking risk and you have to put your work out there if anybody's going to see it. You can build a website, but it doesn't mean anyone's going to come. So, you know, figure out, you know, believe in yourself, believe in your work. Take baby steps if you have to, to put your work out there, get feedback. And remember the feedback's not about you, it's about your painting and listen to it. You might take half of it, you might ignore half of it. Uh, it depends, you know, um, but learn how to take that feedback and take that criticism and, and how to turn it around to help to, you know, if someone says they don't like X about your painting, one thing, well, they've, there's probably a hundred things that they didn't know like or that they liked right so don't mm -hmm. worry about that one thing they didn't like think about everything else that's good and that got you to that point if you're having some trouble because i think a lot of people that putting it out there it's hard it's you know it, it's still hard for people it's still hard for me i mean and i hear this from other artists all the time like well i took a risk and i i i I'm reeling from it a little bit, or I took a risk and hey, it paid off and I feel really good. And the more risk you take, the easier it gets, you yeah. know. I think too, one of the the uh, things that we always tend to forget is just how competitive this industry is. Absolutely. There's a lot of people who would love to have the life of a painter. And, you know, there's not a lot of people who are full-time artists and that live on that, live on that. 
and mm -hmm. and those people are very special but that doesn't mean you can't be part of it exactly um you know it, it takes a little time you know and it takes a lot of effort but you know and you you know when i say finding your market your market might not be a gallery that sells paintings for five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars it might be a gallery that sells work for five hundred dollars and some people might be really happy with that and i think that's great mm -hmm. right i mean if, mm -hmm. if that if they're able you know if you're able to make one thing and get it out in the world and it makes somebody else really happy i feel like that's great like you know you don't have to paint the sistine chapel we already have one we don't need another one paint something that's uniquely you and that that you enjoy that and then find other people to share it with even if even if it's putting it on instagram and you get you know a hundred likes that's a hundred people who like your painting i mean right. and i i think it's 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 good to take those risks you know and 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 put it out there and share your work and take some joy in that um, yeah it's good for you too you know right it's good for the world yeah, one thing that I want I want to step back into the, your marketing points for a second, and um, hopefully Deborah Kierce is listening, and and the ladies of Wham, Carrie, and um, Mariana, and Helen, and I know I'm gonna miss one of you guys, <laughs> so, but I know you guys listen, so I wanted to talk about that group for a minute. They, the Women Artists Mentors is um, a group that they formed, and they're each other's support systems, and they are each other's cheerleaders. And every time that I see them post on Facebook, it's always a fun thing. Um, they are always, a, they're, they're there for one another as artists and as friends. And each of them are you know, climbing up the rings, you know, the rungs of success as, as they go along. But that group, their group is so strong. Their friendships are so strong and their support for each other is so strong that, you know, it's just, and they're having so much fun. And I sit there and look at it, you know, if, if nothing else comes out of it, they have become such great friends and cheerleaders of one another that they will always be exploring and challenging themselves because of their relationships with each other. So, you know, nothing, nobody told them to form this group. They decided to do this on their own and, and yet they, they help each other uh, throughout with marketing and things like that. And, and I had Deb, I had them all actually on my show uh, a while ago. Uh, so there is a, um, a a chat out there that you can listen to and, and when they all talk about why they decided to form this group and, and what each of them get out of it. And um, you know, they travel to Europe or wherever and they go paint for a week together and uh, enjoy each other's companies. And they don't live in the same cities. They all, they live across, you know, well, Carrie, heck, I think she's in Japan right now. So, you know, that doing something like that, just finding artists that are, and they paint different in different mediums and things like that. So they can reach across and, and challenge themselves that way. Um, don't look for similarities as much as you look for differences. If you're going to form a, a group of friends like that, so that you can, you know, dip your toe in the other water and have some guidance on you know how to get there and how to how to work with that particular media or whatever, so um, it's it's I don't know if I really would call that marketing, but I mean they do market themselves as Wham and it does help them a lot. And I think that there's a lot more uh, a lot of artists that are more aware of them because of this uh, little you know, if you want to call it an organization or group or whatever that they formed and. Um, I don't know. I, I always get a smile on my face when I see their posts on Facebook and, and what they're up to. So, you know, maybe I became one of their cheerleaders somewhere <laughs> in there as well. But it, I mean, it's, it was just it was a different thing. You know, instead of artists tearing each other apart, here's a group of artists that are, you know, just cheering each other's arm and, and on and, and having a good um, a good time with it. And I, I'd like to see more of that out there. And I think if that happened, there'd be a whole different change on how things are happening in the industry. Yeah, I think it's that sounds amazing. And kudos to that group of women for pulling together instead of pulling apart, right? Exactly, I mean, yeah. And it, it's definitely networking and marketing, right? You know, and, it, and the other thing is it's community building. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that I have been going to this Monday morning group of local artists and it's called More Creative Juice and a woman, a local woman in Cincinnati puts it on and her whole 
goal is to help artists further their businesses. And so people meet, we meet for coffee for a couple hours on Monday mornings and we just talk about what's going on. And I've certainly made some connections through that group. And uh, it, it reminds me of the type of community I had back in college when I was in art school, where you had like-minded people from diverse backgrounds, not necessarily with the same goal, but with a common goal. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a lot of power in that, even if it's just to say, these are people who understand me, they understand my challenges, they might have solutions for me, but they definitely, they, they can offer me support and, and hopefully ideas and cr some creative ins insights and input that can make my life better, but hopefully I can offer that back to them as well. And so that by working collectively and together, everybody can succeed. I mean, I think yeah. it's, that just sounds amazing. So I, I'm going to follow them on Facebook. Yeah, yeah, do. And they're, they're like I said, they're a great, great, great group of, of ladies. I, I enjoyed having them on the show. And I might have them on the show again to talk about how they actually form their group. Because while, was, while we're sitting here talking, I have tried to form um, some groups mainly on the writing side. And um, I had a really strong group going that we met up at booksellers at Austin, Austin Landing. I had somebody driving in from Troy to join in that group on when we met like on the like, first Tuesdays or something like that of the month. I can't remember now, but the store ended up closing and, and that group disappeared because we didn't have a, a place to meet. And um, we didn't know the store was closing until it actually closed. <laughs> so it wasn't like I could, you know, get in touch with them. Uh, we didn't, I, I don't have, like I did, we didn't get emails and stuff. It was very loose, loosely formed, but trying to actually get a group started is harder, it is hard work in itself. And you have to have those good communication skills and those good networking skills to, to do that. So um, don't give up, yeah, and, and, <laughs> I guess. Amen. And I think, you know, I, Linda, I think you're a good leader. You're a natural leader. And I think that, you know, somebody needs to pull it all together generally, right? right? Like somebody has to say, we're, this is what we're going to do. This is when we're going to do it. These are sort of the parameters. Now let's get going. Right. Um, but, you know, the nice thing about social media these days is, you know, getting a Facebook group together is actually not that difficult, exactly. right? Like you right. can, it can really happen. Yeah. Physical presence groups are a lot harder than you know, internet present groups. <laughs> so, um, I mean, how the one started physically is we went out, I went out, paid the fee at meetup.com and posted it there. And that's, that's the reason why we got people from, you know, basically all, I had people driving up from the outskirts of Cincinnati to Springboro and people driving from Troy and things like, cause there, there wasn't someone that was trying to do this in their own local area. This was, you know, it was a unique little group of authors that got together and I do miss talking to them. So if they're listening, <laughs> send me an email. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. it's, but you're right. I mean, a Facebook group isn't that hard to pull together and would be, you know, a, a great place to start. And, and as I mentioned with Wham, they are in totally different um, st cities, states, and countries. So I think Helen is up in, and Helen, if I get this wrong, I'm going to apologize because I know you guys are listening. Um, I think she was up in Montreal or they traveled to Montreal. They all were in Montreal together. Like I said, Carrie is in Japan because her husband's in the military. Um, she has a whole networking thing that she does through uh, military spouses who paint, who are artists. Um, so you know, there's all of these different opportunities. Don't put yourself in a box, I guess is what I'm, I'm getting down to here is, you know, if you, if you have a thought of, gee, wouldn't it be fun to do this? then organize it and lead it. Cause there's gotta be other people out there. Start with a Facebook group and go from there. So um, I guess it's, you know, our little coaching for the day, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. So, and you talked a little bit about your creative process. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I, we talked in the green room about talking about that and you kind of covered that uh, at the beginning of the thing, but I'm gonna give you a, a, another opportunity here. Is there anything more you wanna talk about your creative process? and? If you want to talk about too, I, I don't know if you have any desire to write a, another art book because you've written a lot of art books. So, <laughs> so um, I have. So I actually have the fifth um, acrylic works book on bold values will be out next. I think it's April at this time. Uh, yay! Congratulations. So thanks. Yeah, I'm really excited. Another great group of artists who submitted their work, and I had a lot of fun. Um, 
you know, when I was publisher, I would sort of pull the art together and um, select the artist and the editorial staff did a lot of the other behind the scenes work. So this time I was able to actually work directly with the artist more. So I got to get to know some of the artists better and that was really exciting for me. So I'm very excited that that's coming out. Um, and yeah, I would definitely be open to writing some other art related either articles or books in the future. Um, probably I wouldn't start doing anything till next year at this point. Of course, next year's in two weeks, so that's easy to accomplish. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would definitely be open to that. I'd love to do another Acrylic Works 6 book. Um, hopefully we can get that going, so we'll just sort of see what happens. Yeah, I keep going back to my, um, I did the How to Paint with from Brush to Palette Knife that's out on Amazon, and I have gotten a lot of people requesting that I turn that into a hard copy book because they have it as an ebook and they want it as a hard copy book. And I just keep going, this is going to take so much planning. And so, well, <laughs> it, yeah. it was easier to throw it together as an ebook than it was to make it a hard copy book. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it'd be kind of interesting. And I don't know if I'll get to that this year, but that's, that's definitely on the list um, for me. Yeah, as I well. think. I think the biggest challenge right now with art books that aren't through a mainstream publisher is the fact that the color on the print on demand products isn't as good as what we would want it to be. Exactly. So that's, that's so like, if you can live with that disappointment, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it would be really awesome to create a self published art book. But if you're not going to use a, you know, a, a professional sort of web printer or full scale printer, that that's something that is just you just have to keep in mind that the colors are a little bit muddier and a little less crisp and um, not calibrated to what we're used to for art books and for artists you know that's so important we like our images to look so good and light filled and and you know all that good stuff yeah you hit the nail on the head because I if the if the images are not what I want them to be they're not as crisp if the color isn't what I want it to be I'm not I'm doing myself a disservice but I'm also doing you know, like I paint with Michael Harding paints. And if that image isn't brilliant, like those paints are, in my opinion, um, you know, I, I'm going to not only do myself a disservice if I'm mentioning that I'm painting with, you know, Michael's paints or Rosemary's brushes or XYZ canvas or whatever, I said, you know, it, it's going to do them a disservice as well. So there's there's a lot riding on that hard copy book that isn't so much riding on the ebook that's out there. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, even the, the people who buy the book, you know, you don't want them to, to be disappointed either, right. obviously, right? I mean, right. I know that you want them to have the best quality. And if they understood that, I guess that would be okay. But I don't think everybody has that understanding of the challenges of print on demand. Yeah, it's, and, and it's challenging. Text is one thing. <laughs> Images right. are a whole nother. So. <laughs> right. So um, I think we, we kind of touched on, on, on this, but I think it's kind of interesting because... Um, you moved like myself, you moved from corporate America um, into basically a, a position where you're you're using your creativity and um, op, you know artist skills, your your writing skills and your entrepreneurial skills. And I guess I, I am always I'm not amazed anymore how much these things overlap, but I, I'm always interesting to hear from folks that have just kind of made that move and and how they, start realizing that a lot of the skills are the same and and how you know creating is to me like this like creative process creating is creating um you find what works for you and you just kind of go after it uh, so what are the big ahas that you've learned for the last you know year while you've been exploring <laughs> let's put it that way <laughs> right so i think one of them is that in working for myself, that one of the first things I did was say, how much money do I spend each month? <laughs> and how much money do I need to make to be able to spend that amount? And if I don't make that much money, what's my plan B? So, you know, I, I hate to say it, but the very first thing I did in January or February was to set up a household budget, which I loosely had in my head, but I actually went through and I mapped out my expenses for all of 2016 and i said this is what i pay to have a car this is what i pay on average for my house here's and my utilities here's my expenses and i i made 
I made a nuts to bolts budget because it, 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 it gave me confidence in what I was going to need to earn. And it also gave me the opportunity to say, well, I don't need to do that. Or I don't need that in my life. So, you know, I pared down a little bit. Uh-huh. But made UDF changes. made the list, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> UDF, yes. Milkshakes, milkshakes and chocolate are still on the list, as are my running shoes. So there are, there are a couple things that I definitely made sure that I included. Um, and if, if, I'm, if people follow me on Facebook, they will know that I have an affinity for sweets. And that has definitely not left my life. Although I have been baking more of my own. So there's that. <laughs> Which is better. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Moderately healthier, right? No preservatives. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So I would say that's the first thing. The other thing is I, I, um, I said, well, what do I want to do? And what are my skills? So, you know, like, what are my, you know, I knew that I couldn't just go be a painter and make my living as a painter. That would be an amazing gift. And although I have no trouble asking the universe for favors and things, I thought that more realistically, you know, I want to be a painter, but my question was, what can I do that will support me and my painting? So, you know, that's been a combination of a lot of freelance editing and writing gigs. So I have sort of said, all right, well, let's try to get 20 hours of work with freelance writing and editing so that I can give 20 hours a week to my painting. I can't say that I'm there either from a revenue standpoint and a discipline standpoint. Like I can't say that I dedicate those 20 hours a week to both at this point, but I'm getting closer and it's still my goal. So I'm happy with where I, what I've done in the last six or seven months. And I think it's going well. I'm, I, you know, I'm pleased with that. And I've, I've got some other writing gigs lined up and I've actually been surprised. It's, you know, I've always considered myself more of an editor than a writer, but the writing part is actually coming along pretty nicely. So that's been really, that's been a pleasant surprise. And I was also pleasantly surprised to realize that I could still paint because I hadn't painted in a while. And I was like, am I going to be able to do this? But <laughs> it's, it's happening. <laughs> hey, well, whether it's a white page or a white canvas, it's still the same thing. You just start. You start it's true. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got this writing assignment. I've got to do five um, artist bios by... I've got about three weeks to finish them. And, and you know, I've had these interviews. And I've just been, I'm like, well, I'm just, I, I'm not exactly sure where to start. So I'll just start someplace and I'll flush it out as I go along. Right. right. Yeah. Right. It happens. Yeah. 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 So that's, it's kind of interesting. Like I said, it's, I, I've talked to musicians. I actually had a couple musicians on the show um, back before I was uh, associated with the FNW group uh, doing art chats. I had uh, my friend Wayne Johnson, who used to play backup guitar. Uh, for Manhattan Transfer, and he played with Bette Midler. I actually saw him in Las Vegas when he was playing for Bette Midler. And, um, you know, I, I was talking to him about the creativity process, and I talked to my writer friends about, you know, the creativity process. And we all just kind of sit there and look at each other and go, getting started, it's really hard. And it's like, yeah, but once you start, it just like flows out of you. And it's like, that to me is like the creative process. I don't want to go any further than defining it. <laughs> you know, it's just, just make that start and the rest seems to fall into place, you know, so. I, I would agree. And, you know, one of the things when I get stuck is because I like these collage backgrounds, sometimes I'll just say, well, you know what, I'm going to pull out six or eight panels and I'm just going to start playing with collage and I'm just going to build those mm -hmm. and see what happens because that's sort of a way to get my, um, you know, my right brain engaged. And that generally is enough of a spark to get me to want to do something to say, oh, what would I want to put on that? Or what would that background, what could that background do? Or what kind of shapes can I make out of this? Um, or if I, you know, if I, I've done a lot of cats, I might say, oh, I don't want to do any more cats. And I'll just sort of start looking through reference photos of other animals or people to say, well, maybe I'll do this next. And usually something catches my eye. Mm. And I, I just start and start to put some, you know, marks down on paper and, and go from there. Yeah, it's it's really kind of interesting because I've been writing more. I mean, I paint as well, but I've been writing more. I haven't been really doing much of anything in the last few months because of, uh, you know, my husband's accident and and we've just lost one of our kitties. But, you know, so it's just like, ugh. 
<laughs> I'm lucky I get my foot out of the bed anymore. But um, it's one of these things that it was really kind of interesting with the, you know, trying to get back into that creative process and, and how dependent I've become anyway, because of my left brain had the dominance for so many years when working with corporate America, you know, my left brain will sit there and go, I'll start to write a sentence out. And my left brain will start automatically analyzing it. And it's like, shut up. <laughs> you know, <don't> do that, <laughs> you know? And I find myself doing that with, with, you know, I'm standing in front of a canvas too. I'm mixing up a color and I'm like, is that going to be the right color? Maybe I should add a little bit more. Of the... I mean, I just find myself that I paralyze myself so much when I start analyzing before I even put the first brush on the stroke on the canvas or I, you know, write that first sentence out or, you know, I just have to like placate my left side of the brain and just saying, we're just typing, just relax. <laughs> right. You can save as, save as, save as. Right? You know, I save it as something else and you can write over it. That's the great thing about computers these days is that you can make as many versions of something as you want. Painting, right. not so much. But but you know, it's at the end of the day, it's paint and canvas. And if it doesn't live any further than two days on the easel and that goes in the corner, that's fine. Well, you that's know, if it gets to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jamie. I say if it gets you to the next painting, then it's served its purpose. Yeah, exactly. I always tell my art students down at Mac, I, you know, we, we work in oil. I teach oil painting and, and I say, it's only oil. And guess what? When it drives, you can dries, you can paint over it. It's going to be okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, so scrape, scrape it off or leave it alone. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why they like oils is very forgiving. So <laughs> anyway, so um, we've actually been chatting now for a little while. Um, anything I want to give you an opportunity, anything you want to ask me or anything else that you want to um, say to our listeners at this point? I mean, I, I guess I would just, to the listeners, I would say, you know, life is, life is short. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll be 50 in a year and, um, do the things you love, you know, just do the lo things you love, even if it's just for yourself, hopefully someone else will love it. But if they don't even, that's okay. Right. Like do, do make the work that you love and, and, and let it be. And, and, and if you want to get it out to the world, you know, listen to what I've said to some extent. There's plenty of other resources on how to market art out there. Um, and, you know, try to just try to find your tribe, I guess. Do what you love and try to find your tribe. I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's great advice. I think that's, that's good. I love this Rufus rabbit. I'm sort of looking at Thank the text you. behind it and that's, I love this one. So. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So he uh, just, he, he just left the home to another, to a collector. So. Aww. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it always like you know, it's like our children leaving the nest. These are our children because yeah. you and I don't have children, so <laughs> we do not. So this is it. Yeah, that's, this is cool. So I like that one. And then there's Wit. He he also is no longer with me. He has oh. left the home too. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we're just kind of going through some of your artwork till I get to this page. There we go. So ah, uh, <laughs> the wrap up, as we call it, you know. It, <laughs> If I had a producer, they'd be sitting there doing the little, you know, symbol from Charlie Brown with the uh, rub my, or not put my arms in a rolling motion or something. However, he says it. Right. Anyway, getting off camp, off topic here. But uh, anyway, so upcoming, what we have is uh, my first book, Blind Influences, being turned into an audio book by a wonderful company out in L.A. by the name of Skyboat Media. And I asked Stefan and Gabrielle, um, who Gabrielle I have interviewed before. Um, but I asked Stefan and Gabrielle if they will come in and uh, talk about the audiobook production and their insight on the book. And so I have that coming up in January. And then we're also going to interview George Gallo again. <laughs> so George just finished. Uh, he's actually in post production right now for Bigger. And he did a movie on David LaFell. And we're going to talk to him about those two things. And we're also going to talk about uh, living a creative light in multiple genres because it was really interesting. Was he was kind enough to call me a number of times while Tom was recuperating. And um, we, you know, I, I would ask him how production was going and he kept comparing it to a painting, how he was painting. So it was really interesting. And I said, we need to talk about this on an art chat. And he goes, yeah, let's do that. So he was all excited about that. So we'll have him sometime uh, soon in January as well. And um, then I'll just kind of do some quick little blog casts whenever they strike me. And that's all coming up in 2018. So hang in there for, for all that. And always appreciate 
the fact that you guys are out there listening to us. And I always appreciate when I have a guest on and Jamie. So um, thank you so much for taking time and, and uh, chatting with us today. I think uh, there's a lot in here that folks are going to snatch up and, and start using. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. I, anytime you want to talk again, just let me know. That sounds good. So everybody okay. have a great holiday season and uh, we'll see you back in January. And um, that's all from this side. So take care. Bye, everyone.